uh, topic here this afternoon has to do with uh, speaking about the sacrament of reconciliation or penance uh, or confession, as it's known variously, and uh, to connect it with sancti sanctification, which is the task of becoming holier. Uh, and uh, I hope I'll be able to do that. But uh, let me start off with um, uh, just the story. I, I was thinking of this the other day. Uh, it made me chuckle. I hope uh, it does for you also. One of the pastors I live with described um, a Franciscan priest, a member of one of those uh, parish mission teams that they used to have years ago, where six or seven or six, eight, seven or eight uh, religious priests would descend on your parish and, uh, for two weeks, three weeks a month, uh, preach every day, and, uh, provide a wonderful uh, apostolate of the confessional. And um, this particular member uh, of the Franciscan Mission Band, I'm told, uh, was a source of some complaints from the pastors. Uh, they said to the provincial uh, in letters complaint that no matter what it is that he uh, preaches about, somehow or other, he always works around to St. Joseph. And uh, there is a lot more to talk about, you know, there are people that just St. Joseph, so can he uh, maybe uh, get on a, a better uh, or more varied number of themes or maybe be taken off the mission then. So uh, the provincial called this priest in to have a heart-to-heart -heart chat with him and said, uh, Father, we really, uh, in all due respect to St. Joseph, there are many things that you need to say about the faith uh, beyond just that one uh, person, that one aspect of, of the Catholic faith. And, uh, the priest agreed uh, somewhat half-heartedly, it seems, because when he got up the next uh, time uh, at the, his uh, parish assignment to uh, help uh, the progress of this parish mission, he began uh, to speak on the sacrament of confession. He said, I'm going to talk about confession today. Blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, confession normally is heard in a, in a box that we call a confessional. And he said, they're traditionally made of wood, and one of the great carpenters... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have no, uh, certainly no historical reason to believe that St. Joseph ever put together a confessional. <laughs> but he is uh, very dear to us all. Uh, I'm very proud to have his name, and uh, increasingly... Uh, in my own work as a bishop uh, uh, to see the uh, paternity of St. Joseph as unique paternal role uh, as foster father of Jesus Christ uh, also reflected in my role as a priest and bishop. And uh, I hope that he will, St. Joseph that is, be particularly close to all of us here today as we uh, uh, gather to reflect on one of the most important elements of our faith, and that is the sacrament of penance. Uh, you know that the Cardinal has assigned me for off and on for 13 years now to be involved in uh, ecumenical and interreligious affairs. Uh, not an easy task, I may say, but um, one which is clearly the will of Jesus Christ. And uh, very little of what Jesus wills for us is easy, but uh, nevertheless an important element of the will of Jesus Christ. And certainly uh, it would be impossible to understand this glorious pontificate in which we find ourselves that John Paul II, unless we understood his own devotion to ecumenism and in a religious dialogue. But in the field specifically of Christian unity, often the sacrament around which the uh, discussions, uh, uh, often sometimes the complaints about uh, the Catholic uh, attitude toward ecumenism is that uh, why won't you let us engage in intercommunion? Why will you not open the Eucharistic table to us? And uh, while well, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our uh, faith, of our worship, uh, certainly, it is not the only sacrament, as we know, and the sacrament of penance is also a very, very uh, intricate, uh, essential part of the uh, Catholic faith as well, because even as Jesus gave us his body and blood, he said uh, that this was for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, so, uh, I think in our ecumenical dialogues, in my opinion, that aspect of the reconciling mission of the Church, the sacramental, forgiveness that the Church uniquely can offer through the power of the presence in it of the Holy Spirit uh, has not yet been sufficiently discussed. And uh, I think uh, uh, it's important for us Catholics to understand that uh, while we need to give primary place to the Eucharist, the forgiveness of sins is not some little adjective, not some little uh, sidebar in the uh, mission of the Church. Uh, it is at the heart of the Eucharist, ultimately, to uh, be a moment of reconciliation uh, toward eternal reconciliation with God in heaven. Uh, I just want to uh, repeat this morning's opening prayer as a way of opening here. And that is, uh, 
the erasure that we used this morning, as I read it earlier today, I thought, uh, uh, I can't, I really don't think we can approve on that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. <laughs> Father, through our observance of Lent, help us to understand the memory of your Son's death and resurrection, and teach us to reflect it in our own lives. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Newman, St. Catherine Drexel, pray for us. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to thank Dr. Ha not only for that uh, kind uh, uh, introduction there, but also for the invitation to come here today. And um, I really am very happy finally to have seen this uh, place, uh, this operation, and have some hint of all the good that goes on here. And when I entered the, the house, it struck me that it was appropriate to say peace to this house. And uh, may that peace uh, remain here always as you. Uh, accomplish uh, a very important goal, and that is uh, the ongoing formation in information and holiness uh, in the life of, of the church. So uh, thank you, uh, every one of you, for all that you've done uh, to make me welcome here today, including a very nice breakfast. Uh, mm -hmm. lunch that day. <laughs> I, I would say uh, uh, the way to my uh, heart is through my stomach in many ways. <laughs> very happy we don't live under any totalitarian government because having said that, I would know the best way to get into break is starving or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I want to do is uh, do the usual uh, drill that the uh, good speakers are supposed to do. Um, tell you what he wants to tell you, uh, tell it to you, and then tell you that he, he just told you that. So <laughs> what I want to do is uh, just to tell you that in terms of the outline, I want to speak simply about uh, what is uh, some thoughts on the nature of reconciliation uh, at some length. And I also want to uh, speak uh, more briefly about the, the nature of sanctification, that is a little easier to accomplish. And then I want to make two comments. One regarding the right of penance and the catechesis surrounding it. Secondly, the second comment will be uh, some discussion around the notion of firm purpose of amendment and the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'll just have some closing remarks. So some thoughts on reconciliation, some thoughts on sanctification, followed by some comments on the catechetical uh, uh, unfolding that precedes the administration of the right of penance, and then some talk on uh, the notion of firm purpose of amendment. There are many aspects. Uh, this is not going to be uh, a thumbnail sketch today of everything one could know about uh, the penance. And for that, uh, we are blessed to have a beautiful compendium in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But these are thoughts that have occurred to me. Um, I'm a priest 32 years and a bishop for just about seven now. And uh, it's important for me to not tell you what you could read elsewhere, but to tell you what the sacrament means to me, and I hope to you and uh, to others that uh, this talk may, may help you with. Uh, I just want to start uh, inspired by the way our Holy Father continually or increasingly uh, handles his important documents to start off with a little uh, reading from the Gospel. This specific one is the, uh, the account of uh, Jesus's encounter with Zacchaeus the tax collector. Jesus came to Jericho and intended to pass through the town. Now a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man, was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached the place Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. And he came down quickly and received Jesus with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to stay at the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. The Gospel of the Lord. I uh, was thinking that when I decided to choose a uh, scripture passage, maybe just to go with the uh, Gospel uh, of yesterday, which uh, dealt with a very similar theme. But I thought the, the reading from Zacchaeus, just dear to me personally, uh, strikes home the fact 
that Jesus wants to live with us. He wants to dwell with us. That he wants to come to us. He wants to, as we say in theology, encounter us, meet us. Um, the, the Gospel passage, uh, specifically of Zacchaeus and other passages, that represent a, a clear message in the Gospels that uh, uh, the union which Jesus wishes for us is quite intense, quite unexpected, deeply humbling, and uh, certainly uh, deeply uplifting as well, because he wants to dwell with us, uh, even the so-called sinners, like Zacchaeus, who was much more righteous than those who were pointing very uh, nasty uh, commentaries at fingers at uh, Zacchaeus and our Lord Jesus for, for the cordiality, the love that Jesus uh, expressed for that particular individual there. Uh, I hope that that will uh, bear us in mind, uh, something that we will bear in mind as we uh, continue this talk here, because uh, I think uh, if we don't understand that, how deeply Jesus wishes to reconcile uh, with us, I mean, uh, have us reconciled with him, I should say. Um, unless we understand that, I think, and uh, similar to what I said in my homily today, for those of you who are there at Mass, uh, we could easily slip into just a natural kind of religion, thinking that the confession is good for the soul and get it off your chest and all those other merely human things. Uh, there's much more to this. Uh, it is in confession, that is, it is a, a meeting with Jesus Christ, and we need to, to understand that. Well, I started to look at uh, some information regarding well, what is the nature of the sacrament of, of uh, reconciliation, of penance. I thought, well, let me start with the uh, introduction to the Rite of Penance, which is the book that we use uh, when hearing confessions in the various uh, formats that are provided now. And uh, I didn't look carefully at what I was uh, reading. I thought I was reading the introduction to the Rite. Instead, what I was reading was the letter, the decree, uh, from the then Secretary of State Cardinal Leo, late Cardinal Leo, and this was written in uh, December of 1973 by special mandate of the Holy Father. And I'm just going to read you the first two paragraphs. I was sort of taken back by someone who sat down and penned about as nice a little compendium of what it, the Church believes about confession as I think one could write. These are just just a letter uh, indicating that. The Latin ritual has been approved, and now it's time to put it into English, which happened in 1975. So these are the first two paragraphs, very brief. Reconciliation between God and men was brought about by our Lord Jesus Christ in the mystery of his death and resurrections. resurrection. The Lord entrusted the ministry of reconciliation to the church in the person of the apostles. The church carries this ministry out by bringing the good news of salvation to men, and by baptizing them in water and the Holy Spirit. Because of human weakness, Christians, quote, turn aside from their early love, end of quote. Uh, That's based on the second chapter of Revelation, the fourth verse. And even break off their friendship with God by sinning. The Lord, therefore, instituted a special sacrament of penance for the pardon of sins committed after baptism. And the reference there is to the 20th chapter of John, which we'll refer to later. And the Church has faithfully celebrated the sacrament throughout the centuries by, in varying ways, but retaining its essential elements. Two paragraphs, I thought, said a great deal. And what does it say? All of this, so it take me more longer to describe what those two paragraphs say than what it took me to actually read them. First of all, those two paragraphs are profoundly Trinitarian. Uh, that whatever we're talking about here in the sacrament of penance is a reconciliation between God and man. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you and me. Secondly, it is Christological. <coughs> it is brought about by Jesus Christ, this reconciliation. He is the person of the Trinity sent to be our Redeemer, and wherever he is, the Spirit follows him and uh, is the instrument by which we are uh, reconciled to the Lord. There is a soteriological message here. Uh, that is, soteriology is a study of the work, uh, the nature, of, and the the operation of Jesus as our Savior, namely this reconciliation between God and ourselves that Jesus accomplished was accomplished specifically through his death and resurrection. And therefore, our reconciliation with Jesus Christ is going to involve a certain immersion, insertion into his death and resurrection, which will not be completely objective, it will also be very subjective because we will have to die in order to rise again. Fourthly, there is an ecclesiological, that is a church aspect to this uh, information that we just read from the 1973 um, letter uh, introduced
introducing the 73 Latin ritual for the right of penance. Uh, that is that this mission of reconciliation, this specific mission, is entrusted to the church. And there is a liturgical message. First of all, this reconciliation begins at the waters of baptism. It does not begin, obviously, in confession. But, as it says, because we turn from our early love, a lovely afraid, we turn from our early love, there is, by the will of Jesus Christ, specific will of Jesus Christ, a special sacrament. This is not an invention of the church. A special sacrament that uh, helps us to uh, reach, once again, back to our baptismal innocence, so that we can make up for uh, uh, the uh, uh, errors, uh, the, the waywardness that we had maybe entered into as we turn from, I do love that phrase, our early love, which is the second chapter of uh, the program. Uh, sixthly, uh, there is a, a sacramental aspect to the information I just mentioned, namely, that in our reconciliation, uh, through and in and through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is a reconciliation with God, through the use of outward signs and words and gestures, with others, and with ourself. There's a, a perfect uh, inclusiveness there. Uh, there's nothing left out there. There's nothing else to be reconciled with. God, the world, including the, well, most of all the people out there, and ourselves. And the, uh, the text, that seems to me, also uh, brings up what is developed very beautifully in the document that I was originally searching for, namely uh, the uh, seven or eight page long introduction uh, to the uh, uh, ritual uh, uh, elements of the sacrament itself. I, I do want to say in parenthesis that if you really want to enjoy yourself uh, theologically for an afternoon, just go to those ritual books that have been published in the last uh, 40 years or so uh, in English and um, uh, read the introductions, because they're beautifully written, very simply written, and uh, bring up a wealth of material uh, that has been repeated and reflected and echoed very well by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism itself is, is, is always a, a source, but to get a, maybe, a, a, maybe sometimes a slightly more poetic version uh, of uh, the teachings, they, they use those introductory uh, pages to the ritual books for the sacraments, whether it's the, uh, the Roman Missal, or whether it's the Rite of Penance, or the anointing of the sick, whatever it is. Uh, there, there, there are not many things that you have any access to or have read, but they're really quite beautiful. And they, in this particular case, the um, introduction to the Rite of Penance, which follows the letter from Cardinal Leo that I read uh, two paragraphs from, uh, mentions the four essential elements that the sacrament of penance brings about. Contrition, that is sorrow for our sins, that is God-inspired, not merely a sentiment, but uh, God-inspired uh, confession, namely to uh, express to a representative of God, granted merely a human, but the power to be the representative of Jesus Christ, uh, the priest or bishop, in this case, um, the confession of sins, satisfaction for those sins, the uh, performance of some kind of penance, making up for the uh, neglect uh, that the uh, sins uh, show in our spiritual lives, and above all, all of that reaching up to absolution. Uh, any one of those elements missing, it's not the sacramental reconciliation uh, that we uh, seek to achieve there. It's something far less than that. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, I'm not going to repeat what it says, it's, it's uh, right there for you to read. And I, what I just want to say, uh, if you haven't decided to do this, uh, sometimes carrying the Catechism around to a, a gathering, uh, to a lecture or, or something, that may, you may find that it's a little tough on the shoulder. It's a, Beautiful book, but not light in any, in any sense of that word. Um, I have now got myself a paperback version, had the uh, binder, or one of those Mr. or Sir Speedy places, uh, you know, take off the, uh, the cover and just take the four books of the, of the catechism and bind them like this so that on an occasion like this, uh, what I want to deal with a particular section, uh, namely the part on the, uh, the sacraments of the church, I can just bring that with me. So just uh, passing along a little uh, helpful advice, I hope. Uh, the specific uh, uh, numbers regarding uh, the sacrament of penance uh, come from number 1440 to 1484, 1440 to 1484. I'm not going to read those to you, just to read them here. Uh, they do a beautiful job there, uh, reflecting everything I just uh, said, because what I said is in the ritual, so the church is very consistent in not saying one thing um, in the ritual book and then another in the catechism. Uh, there are differences in phraseology, obviously, uh, different reasons for the writing of the documents, but uh, the documents are very consistent 
Uh, and at the end of this, there's a lovely section of animal on indulgences, and also, uh, which are uh, most understood, and a lovely compendium at the end, specifically from 1485 to 1498. Uh, those are really quite lovely. Uh, specifically in the summaries, those in brief sections, which are, are golden. Um, 1485 um, mentions uh, uh, one moment of the institution of the church in the history of our Lord's mission, and namely what we read about in the 20th chapter of John is by no means the only uh, scriptural foundation for the institution of the um, um, sacrament of reconciliation, but it is uh, singled out uh, in that uh, particular number, 1485, so that uh, whenever we speak of the sacraments, uh, we're not talking about uh, idol developments in the history of the church, but things that are rooted in the mission, uh, more or less specifically, in the, in the mission of Jesus Christ. Um, 1490 uh, mentions this firm purpose of amendment. Let me just read that, uh, because I'm going to comment more on that later. Uh, the movement of return to God, call a conversion and repentance, entails sorrow for and abhorrence of sins committed, and the firm purpose of sinning no more in the future. Conversion touches the past and the future, Often for God, I think, when people go to confession, we, we emphasize, naturally, very much the past. You know, we're often very ashamed of, but it's the future we're dealing with. How are we going to be uh, made more strong in the future? And conversion is nourished by open God's mercy. Uh, that, for a purpose of amendment, uh, in its extreme, can become uh, a, uh, a merely human effort to, to become perfect. And uh, that can lead us into terrible trouble because we'll become perfectionists, which uh, uh, is not very helpful sometimes to God because it's really a variation of pride. But on the other side, I, I do want to speak about that later, that that firm purpose of amendment needs to be firm. It needs to be firm. It, it does not, it's, it's not something that should be um, taken lightly where we're so caught up with the past sins, the present confession, and the future, we'll think about that later. No, that's all got to be thought of as a, as a package. And lastly, I just want to single out number 1496, some of the spiritual effects that come uh, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the ongoing uh, teaching of the Church, uh, reconciliation with God, the remission of eternal punishment uh, and mortal sin, the remission in part of temporal punishment, and uh, peace and serenity of conscience, and the increase of spiritual strength. I think the Catechism sometimes has a way of putting things so beautifully. Peace and serenity of conscience and in an increase in spiritual strength. And I also mentioned that there's a lovely section there as well uh, on uh, indulgences, which is uh, perhaps one of the most misunderstood uh, doctrines of the Catholic Church. I remember when the Holy Father uh, issued a, uh, uh, a document on the uh, Jubilee year indulgence. Uh, I had one well, Lutheran official uh, come to me rather nervously that uh, isn't this sort of going backwards? And I thought, you know, uh, granted it, it was the abuse of indulgences which would be one of the major causes of the uh, Protestant Reformation, but uh, uh, the abuse was overcome in the beautiful doctrine about indulgences set forth in the Council of Trent and taken up by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So that's right there in those sections that I gave you, and uh, we can uh, uh, maybe talk about that later. But that's not the, the precise theme of our coming here together today. Let me just speak now a little bit about the nature of sanctification. And I just want to take apart that word a little bit. Sanctification in English comes from sanctificare, in uh, the verb to sanctify, to, to be made holy. It's literally what it means, to be made holy. Uh, that um, uh, has come down to us as uh, uh, the fundamental goal of our Christian existence. I want to um, uh, introduce something here that I, I always am grateful uh, to our Holy Father. About. And that is that uh, we always have to be very, very careful uh, when we speak about uh, our doctrines, about our practices, uh, to tie them always into, I've been doing that this morning a lot, into the person of Jesus Christ. Lest uh, these doctrines, lest these practices uh, wither because they are separated from their source. In and of themselves, they have great beauty, but they are uh, only as powerful as they are connected with the person of Jesus Christ. So we have to be, who is the truth? very careful about that. So to become holy uh, is not a, a philosophical endeavor or a, an ideal of some sort. Uh, it is not simply that, but rather it, we can take the word to become holy and substitute 
to become Jesus, to become like Jesus Christ. And let me say that uh, sometimes one of the most astounding things that a preacher can emphasize when he's speaking about sanctifying grace, that grace which makes us holy, that grace which makes us like Jesus, is to bring out the word divinization. I'm not going to get into that today. But I mean, a very strong word that is very much accepted uh, in our Catholic theology, that we are divinized, that we are made like God. Not God, obviously, but we are made like God. It's, it's very fair, very just for us to use that word that um, we become like God because the, the life that is within us is not merely human, but it is the, the divine life of Jesus Christ. And uh, I think in that uh, rests our hope, and I hope that uh, in our own day we will heed uh, the oft-repeated uh, desire of our Holy Father that uh, uh, we become just a little bit more personalist in our presentation of the Gospel, that it is not simply for proclaiming the doctrine that they have to come, but the first doctrine of all is that God, in Jesus Christ, has sought us out. It is a person-to-person -person encounter that follows directly from that are truths that must be held and um, truths that must be lived not just held uh, intellectually, but lived as well. But the first thing is, none of that would make any sense if it weren't for the fact that it was an incarnation, that God became like us in all things but sin, in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I just want to um, emphasize, therefore, that if we're talking here today about the sacrament of reconciliation, making us more like Jesus Christ, then the whole purpose of going to confession is sanctification meaning that we become, through this experience of confession, more like Jesus Christ. And uh, that is really, uh, I think, the, the essence of, of our conversation uh, here today. And uh, therefore, the, the practical comments I want to make, I hope will, will help us uh, along that line. Because um, I think we live in, um, in a funny era when it comes to the sacrament of confession. On the one hand, uh, I remember years and years ago, uh, people used to uh, hold us Catholics apart uh, uh, because of our uh, practice of confession. I know there were people who spoke to me about the fact that they would become a Catholic were it not for the insistence on um, uh, auricular confession, namely uh, confession whereby on a regular basis, on a normal basis, we're not talking about plane crashes and things like that, but on a regular basis, that, that a normal basis, one would confess uh, in, a he in a heard way in an irregular way, uh, one sin, so that the, uh, the priest or bishop or the confession will be able uh, to forgive something specific, not just something general. And um, I, I think that uh, if that characterized us in the past, uh, what characterizes us now is that obviously a lot of Catholics have stopped coming to confession. And um, years and years ago, uh, uh, Fulton Sheen said one time uh, that what the church sometimes disposes of it, uh, uh, frequent, uh, or I should say maybe not so much the church, but church members, dispose of in their regular practice, the world takes up and sometimes perverts. He was speaking specifically about the wearing of the cross, how that has now become part of jewelry, and, I mean, worn by people who I don't, don't really think understand uh, the power of the, of the symbol that they're wearing in their uh, understandable ignorance uh, and their unenlightenment. But uh, that, that happened there. I think it has happened here as well. I mean, how often have you heard that? The very sort of thing that's going on on all the radio and, talk, and television talk shows is precisely what we used to call, uh, in a sense, confession. People speak very frankly, sometimes too frankly, about what is happening in their lives. And uh, the trouble is, though, that uh, there is an examination of conscience and there's a confession there in a very public forum, but there's no uh, evidence of satisfaction and no evidence at all of absolution except just the human element of getting it off your chest. So, um, obviously, uh, one comment, the first comment I want to make today is to speak about the right of penance and the catechesis leading up uh, to that right. Because if the catechesis to the right, R-I-T-E, is um, proper, it will move people to make use of this sacrament, whereby they will be truly reconciled, truly understanding what is happening to them, and above all, they will become more like Jesus Christ. So if the opportunity is there to become like more like Jesus Christ, why do we not take it? Obviously, the reason why many people do not take that route is simply because they don't understand it. They still have some of those old fears that we talked before, or see no longer any reason for uh, this particular practice. And I think that is uh, something I'd like to, to address right now. Let me just speak 
from my own uh, uh, personal experience here. Uh, first of all, growing up um, in what was St. Columba Parish, uh, now St. Mark's, the poorest parish at the 24th of Lehigh, we were uh, very, very uh, carefully instructed in the nature of what was going to happen to us. It was very clear, it seems to me, uh, if not perfect, but it was clear that this was going to mean forgiveness of our sins by God himself through the power of a human being who happened to be a priest, more than just an average human being, someone who had been sacramentally configured to Jesus and could act in the person of Jesus. There's no, uh, no doubt about that. We were not just telling our sins to a stranger, but rather to someone who could hear and then bring us the hearing of the assurance of, of our forgiveness more than any talk show host could. So uh, I remember as a child, uh, periodically, weekly in school, whether we went to confession as a school body or whether we were left to do that on our own on Saturday, we did regularly because our parents made sure that we did. They did and we did. And it was not a forced and unpleasant thing. I have no memories of that at all. I'll get into that later as to why, I think. But um, it was just understood without there being a lot of uh, screaming or carrying on that if it's Saturday, you go to confession. Simple as that. Uh, however, whether we went as a student body uh, in elementary school or high school or whether we went uh, as individuals on Saturday, uh, I always remember we could only go on Saturday afternoon. We were not allowed to go on Saturday night. The, uh, the priest didn't want the children going at night. They wanted the adults at night. But uh, we went in the afternoon. Uh, we also were very, very well prepared by a very thorough examination of conscience. I, I think back to those days, how very uh, complete, very beautiful, and at times, how very frank those examinations of conscience were. In an era when allegedly we were a lot more uptight than we are right now. I don't know about that. I mean, I think that we, it's ironic in many ways that we become somewhat more reticent about some issues now uh, and not speaking about them than uh, we were then. Uh, I mean, many of these stereotypes of these examinations of conscience are just that. They're not part of my experience. Uh, they are uh, somebody else's experience because we were not tortured or led into all kinds of horrible uh, experiences. Yes, maybe at times we missed got a little too uh, uh, carried away with uh, a perfectionism of some sort, but everybody has to face that in every aspect of life. Um, so I think there was, first of all, uh, in my own uh, upbringing, perhaps some of you have this experience, a very, very fine catechetical presentation, a very humane presentation in helping us to understand what's wrong with us and what kind of wrong things we do, but on the other hand, helping us also to know that we can do something. I remember also that we were instructed in some uh, what moral theologians might call reflex principles. Uh, what do you do with a thought? You know, if you if you want, if you're angry at someone, uh, you're, you're thinking about it as opposed to uh, or, or feeling angry as opposed to consenting into some kind of plan of action as performing the plan of action. We understood the, the distinctions there, so that when we felt angry, we didn't uh, automatically assume that we had slipped into sin. We knew the difference between the temptation and a sin. And I think that was very maturing for us because we realized that as long as we were alive, we were going to have feelings. But it was the actions that we based upon those feelings, that the, the, the tendencies those feelings directed us into that were the source of, of, of sin, as this, the Gospels tell us. But I think what helped a great deal was also the kind confessors. I, all the priests that I had my childhood, I remember being very kind. And what I mean by that was there was a sense of Welcome in the tone of their voice. I do remember a contemporary of mine telling me uh, when I was first ordained how important the tone of voice is in confession because generally people can't see you, but they can hear you. And um, they really do need to know from the tone of your voice that you are acting uh, the way our Lord himself acted in going to the house of Zacchaeus, to whom he spoke very directly and very sweetly, obviously, to, to attract this man to such a level of conversion. As I say, um, <coughs> Part of that excellent uh, catechetical formation was a gradual exposure to the richness of the doctrine and the practice of confession. What I mean by that is we were taught simply how to make a confession at a very young age, uh, probably in my case, second grade. Obviously, as we progress into third, fourth, fifth, eighth grade, uh, seniors in high school, college uh, adults and uh, young adults, older adults and what have you, uh, the nature of these confessions had to evolve, had to change, because we had different circumstances, different experiences in life. And, a, a, and an enrichment was constantly necessary by our own um, exposure to uh, holy people, to 
beautiful writings to, to good experiences of the confessions between. We uh, were led to uh, understand the need for a firm purpose of amendment, that uh, this was not uh, uh, some desire on the part of the parish priest to torture us by having us talk about a lot of things uh, that were simpler or more complex. The whole idea was to understand what it was precisely that was bothering us spiritually, to explicitate it for a, a confessor, explicitating it for God and for ourselves as well. And oftentimes, uh, it was in high school that I was blessed uh, by the Jesuit fathers uh, with spiritual direction. Spiritual direction and confession are two uh, sides of a coin, if you will. They're not to be confused. But uh, they go hand in hand in many ways because the uh, spiritual direction that we get, uh, which can be longer than a confession, uh, can be more specific and not, doesn't always deal precisely with sin, but deals with the general direction of our spiritual life. Uh, that can help us to have that firm purpose of amendment, that conversion, that uh, takes us away from just doing the same thing all the time, uh, even if we do fail all the time, continuing to try not to fail any longer. And I did mention those reflex principles that we were taught, those things that uh, we sort of were able to figure out. Uh, what do we do here? You know, were we totally innocent, despite our feelings? Or were we totally guilty? Or do we do something sinful, or do we not do something sinful? I, I think we were less burdened with guilt. I, I often find uh, if some of our young people today are not more burdened by guilt, if their desire to live is a lot, is a lot less, um, a lot uh, more uh, lessened in their lives because of the fact that uh, uh, they sometimes carry uh, unnecessary guilt around or an unnecessary uh, uh, mishandling of what they are guilty of. They don't know what to do with that, and uh, there's a yearning inside of us to to address all of that. So I, I just exposed to you what was my childhood experience, and my boyhood experience, and uh, through the high school years. Uh, and also in my seminary and early priesthood to this day. Uh, it is my custom, uh, I often went out with a priest friend uh, approximately every week uh, to uh, make sure that I make a confession. I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but it, it, just to show you that it means something to me, that I'm not exempt from that right now. I'll be seeing my spiritual director tonight, and I'll take that opportunity to make a confession to him because I haven't seen the, one of the priests that I normally see for that purpose. So, uh, it is an important part of my life that when we got into the uh, uh, new right of penance, which the Second Vatican Council called for, you'll see it there, it was cited in the um, uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council, which called for a renewal of all of the rights uh, of the sac seven sacraments themselves and certain related aspects, for example, like indulgences. The, uh, the, um, the list of indulgences was revised as part of the mandate of the, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the beauty of that 1973 right, which entered into uh, the English-speaking world in 1975-1976, was first of all, there was a much fuller expression of the nature of the sacrament in not just the uh, letter that I read, but also the uh, introduction to the ritual and then the commentary throughout the ritual itself. Just by reading the ritual book, uh, if one didn't understand uh, much about the sacrament, one would gain a, a much better perspective or that might have been gained by reading the former ritual books, which were uh, very pragmatically designed. Understandably, coming out of the confusion of the uh, post-Reformation era, when the church had to kind of uh, quickly get its act together uh, in view of the tremendous onslaughts against its uh, uh, teachings and uh, do things very, very pragmatically, but sometimes so pragmatically that a certain richness was lost. Um, a beautiful expression of the nature of this sacrament is seen in this ritual book and the other ones as well. For that, I'm very, very grateful. And also, greater choices of prayers and their rights. Uh, I remember the first time that I participated in, as a confessor, one of the uh, group uh, rights, uh, whereby uh, uh, instead of uh, there just being a confessor or several confessors hearing confessions privately uh, along the, uh, in the confessionals of a, of a church, uh, many hundreds of people are brought together and many dozens of confessors are brought together and the individual confession and absolution was administered at the end of a celebration of, of sacred scripture, the word of God, and a, a, a motivating homily, which, uh, let's face it, uh, as children, certainly uh, many of you would, uh, and even now, uh, when people come in to make their confession very quickly on a Saturday afternoon, one never knows, despite the fact that it's great that they're there, one never knows that they kind of left behind 
all of your worldly cares. But when you have those large celebrations like that, you're there long enough, and with a, a beautiful uh, use of uh, the Word of God and official prayers of the church and legal music, to set the appropriate uh, stage for the Word of God to grow in our hearts and be uh, elevated by uh, the sacramental absolution. Uh, so I think that, that part of the rite was, uh, was very helpful there. But unlike the introduction of the reform of the um, celebration of Mass, which occurred in gradual steps in Advent of 1964, again around 1966, 67, and then very, very uh, uh, clearly when the Novus Ordo was introduced with the uh, what we now call the sacramentary here in the United States. Uh, when all of those were introduced, uh, there was a certain gradualism there that helped people uh, understand uh, what the church was trying to accomplish here. But in this case, this is, really, I think, really the first time that the newspapers, the media, got a hold of uh, a long uh, effort that the church was facing in the middle 70s here in the United States to implement a new ritual book, namely the new rite of penance, with its opportunity for individual confessions and absolution, individual absolution and confession in the context of a scripture service and the proclamation of the word of God, and other uh, uh, possibilities as well uh, that I'll get into that uh, were very much misunderstood. Among, there were three um, elements here that I want to emphasize that came into effect as a result of the 1973 reform, which I think were the result of very poor catechesis here in this country. Uh, I think there are people who have to answer to that uh, in many ways. It was done very hastily. Uh, the media, it seemed to me, latched on to certain uh, more um, uh, controversial aspects of the, uh, uh, the uh, much more public aspects of the new right and uh, people began to live out what Will Rogers used to say, I only know what I read in the newspaper. Uh, instead of getting a very clear catechesis, the catechesis, as, you, as it were, that they were given came mostly, it seems to be, from, the, from newspapers. And uh, there were th three elements there that I think uh, were, uh, uh, had to be faced. The first is that um, the new right dependence meant face-to-face -face confession. And I think this became a draw to some people uh, and became an enormous obstacle for other people because uh, they enjoyed the anonymity of making a confession. I think one of the most merciful things the church could do for us was uh, uh, while we were admitting to um, a priest what our sins were, we were not forced to, uh, uh, to face him. Uh, we, we could uh, just uh, imagine him and, and uh, you know, speak to him through uh, some kind of a screen or a curtain or something. And uh, that made it a little easier for some people. Uh, but once it became set in people's minds that this new right of penance means that from now on, when you go to confession, you're going to be forced to face the priest, who may be a relative of yours, <laughs> who might work uh, every day. And, uh, I always remember in the old days of parishes, the, the lived-in housekeeper always had a problem. They always had to go to another place for confession because they work for those priests every day. <laughs> now that's true of our vastly increased uh, uh, rectory staffs that uh, people who are uh, secretaries, uh, business managers, etc. It's very difficult for them. Their voices are known and what have you. So um, this was discouraging to some people. It is not required in the 1973 right. It was not required when this right was introduced in English in 1975, but it became a sticking point. It still is in many ways. Oh, I don't go to confession anymore 30, 35, 40 years now because uh, I had to go to confession face to face. I don't like that stuff. Well, it's not true, but unfortunately it sticks. The second thing was, and we hold up with this still, that the new right of penance and general absolution were synonymous. From now on, there's no need for you to go to confession, to uh, uh, speak your sins to a priest, to receive indiv individual absolution. Sometime during Mass, uh, a priest would uh, speak uh, that uh, now you're all being given general absolution. And we, we know from childhood that general absolution was designed that when the plane was coming down, <laughs> the ship was going down, that somebody would get up and since it was not possible to spend the time hearing 4,000 confessions on a ship or 100, 200, 300 on an airplane, we had that many Catholics there, that in, in a case like that, absolution was possible in a general way, but the idea was if you survived, that you still had to go back to confess these sins, that uh, uh, that, that requirement still had to be met. Instead, people began to think, well, why should I bother myself going to that priest there uh, on Saturday afternoon when if I just go on a Sunday morning, I'm going to receive the same thing without all the trouble. Kill two birds with one stone. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't disturb me to have to, to, to say anything. I don't have to bring anything up because it's all covered by 
general absolution. The second problem, I mean, that has still sticks with many people. They, they just don't see the need for confession because they, they see general absolution as the way out. The church has recently reiterated again and again and again that uh, general absolution is a, a, a an option under extreme circumstances, warfare, catastrophes, that sort of thing. Um, and when it is done, there is still the need for individual confession and absolution should survival occur, we hope, and uh, that uh, it is not the norm at all, that it is the exception, not the norm, but the exception is what's stick, and uh, that's what's stuck here. And lastly, um, with the introduction, rightfully so, of a variety of prayers and uh, rituals that were, that were possible in confession, as we read there, the church has had a very uh, expression over the centuries of how it exercises this auricular confession, this hearing of confessions. But the general, I mean, the, the essential aspects are the same, no matter what the, the ritual may have been rearranged to be. All those four elements of the, of the examination of conscience and confession of sins and contrition and absolution remain. Uh, people may kind of say now, well, now I used to be able to go to confession this way, and now I, I can't learn that new way, or it's so complicated, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to annoy the priest if I tell him all these that I don't know what to say. And uh, that's really all very, really very sad, that in an effort to introduce a greater richness of prayer, a deeper experience of reconciliation through uh, newly uh, uh, written prayers, or prayers brought back from ancient sources, that people began to experience confusion and an alienation from uh, reconciliation, the sacrament of reconciliation, and not a deep, deeper desire to believe it. So I think that's very, very sad, uh, and we still deal with that uh, today. So those uh, those points uh, that uh, the new right of penance means face-to-face -face confession, it means general absolution, it means I don't know what to say uh, because it's very confusing right now. Those things, in my opinion, still continue to have a, a hold on people and uh, are preventing us. So what do I suggest for that? The end of my first comment. Need to go into a period now of greater catechetical care. The liturgy and the church's mission of catechesis, which means an echo, uh, you know, a resounding of, of, a, of a simple announcement, um, these things uh, need to be brought hand in hand. I heard this from those who are uh, experts in the liturgy, those who are experts at catechesis, that they are not talking to each other very much. They don't have a chance to talk to each other. And as a result, you have this beautiful book put together by uh, experts in the history of the liturgy, and then uh, it is handed over to uh, another group, and there's not much conversation between the two, and as a result, I believe that what you have here uh, is, is this catechetical crisis, this misunderstanding of what the sacrament is all about. I think we need to take greater, greater catechetical care, get those two groups together, and uh, do something uh, for uh, whether we're talking about young people at the elementary school level who would be going to confession for the first time, for those adults or young persons who would come into the church later in life, um, that they, in both cases, that greater catechetical care needs to be taken to instruct people in the essence of the sacrament uh, and the simple way of going to confession and through ongoing care, which will help them enrich those fundamental experiences. You start with the fundamentals, you know, we learn how to add two and two, and the next thing you know, 12 years later, we're doing calculus, so we don't, don't go the other way around. Um, we start very simply and just get a good experience initially of the sacrament then we will be fine. I do think that requires, secondly, a gradual approach to our catechesis. You may remember when we were using um, the Baltimore Catechism here in the United States, something that often was not noted was that there were three or four versions of that uh, that were used for very small children, children who weren't as small, children who were older, and then even adults. Uh, because uh, as you grow, you need to know more, you can experience more, uh, your, the appetite is greater, the desire is greater, and should be uh, satisfied. I think we might want to do that as well. That we may want to develop a, a means of um, making a confession that is ingrained in children, and then by the time we become adults, there is another experience whereby we learn how to deepen that and expand on that, uh, perhaps in a gradual way, through spiritual direction, through ongoing uh, information and formation. Um, lastly, I think we need to do some clarifying about those three points, face-to-face uh, -face confession, general absolution, and I don't know what to say. Actually, the solution to that last one is, I always tell people, just go into the confessional. The priest will take care of what you want to say. Uh, he'll help you with that. And uh, that, I think, was a, a great help uh, when we had the reconciliation weekend in the year 2000, and you know, we're going to have another one of them coming up the weekend of uh, March uh, 28, 29, and uh, the word is just getting out about that now in the media. 
and uh, that's the best way to handle that. If you have a friend who says, uh, oh, I don't want to go to confession face-to-face, -face, you don't have to go to confession face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, if you're not going to get general absolution, you are going to have to tell your sins to the priest, but you're going to be very rewarded for that. And in terms of how to get to that point, don't worry about that. Just get inside, the priest will take care of all of that for you. And uh, most priests that I know, uh, most, the overwhelming majority that I know are extremely careful about their tone of voice, what they say, and trying to encourage people. So uh, I don't think that the likelihood of getting some grumpy priest is, uh, is there. I hope not. But uh, we're only human. If that's the case, there's always another priest to go to. Um, I do remember one time, I was a man who was a priest right now, and he was a sub he went to confession, and he thought the priest was not very nice to him at all. And he just told him, he said, look, I've studied enough theology to know that's not the way to hear a confession. So he said, I'm not going to somebody else, but I'll go to someplace else. And, uh, where, you know, he thought he was, uh, you know, more, more, more appropriately treated as he should be, not uh, grumpily or, or given short shrift or anything like that, but treated uh, as Zacchaeus was treated by Jesus Christ. Uh, I think we do need to uh, uh, get back to helping people in our catechesis understand what is the role of an examination of conscience, so that when we go into the confessional, while we don't engage in scrupulosity or you know, mining up every detail, which only tortures us, which is in many ways the work of the devil, if we're not careful. Uh, you know, to, the devil's great weapon is to discourage us. Uh, again, the, the priest is the judge. He is the judge of the integrity of the confession. And if there's something you're not saying, then he'll be able to uh, help you to, uh, to say what you need to say. Uh, you, know, I mean, you can tell from a person's voice that they're holding back something and they want to say more. And there are ways of encouraging that. So I hope that we would be able in our new catechesis, uh, there are many lovely booklets out there, beautiful examinations of conscience that are not uh, merely pragmatic, but which are, are help people to get to the root of conversion, which I'm going to go into lastly now. And I think some of those reflex principles also are, are, are missing in people's minds. They don't know how to analyze something that has happened to them, some experience, or something that they have done. I shouldn't make it all sound so passive, but something that they have done. They don't always know how to handle that. Uh, I don't know where here I was guilty, where here I was a victim of circumstances, where here I was in ignorance, where I was uh, quite sinful. Uh, I remember one time a priest at Mount St. Mary was being told by a seminarian that he had a guilt complex, and after listening to the, uh, the young man, the priest said, I had good news and I had bad news. Uh, the good news is you don't have a, uh, a guilt complex, the bad news is that you are guilty. <laughs> so, uh, I once again, James Mulligan, who's uh, the young uh, was the priest of Christ there, but very well put. I mean, the priest does that in confession, too. We have to understand where we're guilty and where we're using a lot of this uh, psycho babble uh, in, in our minds here. And I do want to make a strike up a little right now for uh, the sacrament, uh, for the, uh, a, a detail of the sacrament, which I think is also forgotten, and that is the importance of the, uh, the spiritual direction to help us to leave the confessional and then have someone that we can go back to and speak at greater length about uh, the, uh, the sacrament here because many times uh, uh, the confession has to be relatively quick. We can't have people embarrassed by having a confession lengthened unduly, but there are times we need to speak more uh, plainly to a priest or to some holy person who can help us to uh, see the deceit in our lives, uh, where we're deceiving ourselves, where we're being too generous to ourselves, where we're being uh, too hard on ourselves, uh, and thinking we're doing God's will, or what we're doing is uh, making burdens for ourselves that God does not intend for us. So we have to be very, very careful there. And I'm not speaking as some kind of a, a person going to one extreme or the other, we're trying to avoid those extremes. Um, I read you, the uh, final comment I want to make is uh, about this firm purpose of amendment. I did read to you uh, that the section from number 1490 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is that part of the, confessional, of, of the confession that deals with the future. Uh, all right, we brought up the past, painful as that might have been. Uh, we've been consoled by the words of absolution, knowing that Jesus Christ, the person of that priest, forgives us. Now what? Now the grace of the sacrament becomes uh, operative in another dimension. Not only does it take away, but brings in a grace that helps us to uh, uh, continue to convert, continue to know uh, what uh, we have to do and uh, how to overcome it. And sometimes that comes to us in a surprising way. God sometimes is kind of uh, kind to us, lets us go for a little bit, and then all of a sudden tells us that, you know, that sort of um, uh, half-hearted uh, conversion is no longer necessary. Now you really want to have to dig down and suffer a little bit more because uh, in that kind of suffering you'll become more like me and uh, more like Jesus Christ. And that is a, a great goal there. So that, for a purpose of amendment, is something I want to address here. 
Uh, I was uh, talking to Dr. Haas briefly before the, the, my talk here, and we got talking briefly about St. Alphonsus the Lord, and I said, uh, it's funny, he I'm evidently was on people's minds these days, uh, often because in Lent, one of the classic um, presentations of the Stations of the Cross um, uh, was written by uh, Alphonsus the Lord, and many other things as well. Uh, I, he's a great favorite of mine because he was a bishop, uh, he's from southern Italy, where my family is, my father's family is from, and um, also was plagued in his own life by a great scrupulosity, and uh, managed to uh, instill in himself and in his followers, he was the founder of the Redemptorist Fathers and Brothers, uh, a special ministry to those who are overly scrupulous uh, in the confessional. So the Lord granted him this great cross of being too punctilious at times about his uh, state of life, and uh, through that terrible burden, uh, enabled him to be liberated and help others become liberated from this uh, uh, deception that uh, our conversion is all up to us. St. Alphonsus Liberi lived in an era when there were a lot of uh, schools of thought about uh, how one should handle uh, various moral choices. Uh, not going to go into all of that, but you had uh, you know, those who said uh, you can choose either one of two good uh, choices or you've got to choose the safer of the two uh, good choices or you've got to be very, very safe, uh, you can't be uh, you know, too careful. And uh, St. Alphonsus de Bore said, when you are facing two good choices, what's going to help you to make the right choice is figure out where is the cross to be found in all of that. Not mindless suffering, or, you know, we're not, we're not uh, people who are devoted to inflicting suffering on ourselves. After, you know, who could be attracted to a, a faith like that? But rather, where do we have to sacrifice more? Where do we have to make ourselves more like Jesus Christ? What of the two options, good options in front of us, do we take that makes us more like Jesus Christ? And I think that is something that uh, perhaps we've lost something of in our preaching, I think in our inter-confessional advice, and maybe even in spiritual direction and in other uh, areas of advice as well. And that is uh, to remind people that um, it doesn't hurt to make a little bit more of a sacrifice. Again, I'm not nuancing things completely here. I'm not talking about every person. Some consciences are more delicate. Some people are really doing enough uh, at the moment. I mean, it would be a uh, hypocritical act for a priest to burden someone who already has many burdens uh, uh, with further burdens. But uh, it doesn't hurt ever to suggest, uh, in the context of grace, that maybe of the two choices open to you that are both good, whether it's vocation, means of conversion, whatever it is, take the one that will help you to carry the cross a little bit more, because in that further insertion, that subjective insertion into this great gift of reconciliation, uh, through the grace of God, we become more and more like Jesus Christ, dying to ourselves and in living more and more to Him. Lastly, uh, let me just say some other aspects about the, uh, the cross, uh, which I think is important to restore to our practice of our understanding of the sacrament of confession. I am very influenced in some of what I'm going to say here by uh, uh, Chiara Lubick. Some of you may know Chiara Lubick, L-U-B-I-C-H. She is from the Tyrolean region of Italy, though her native language is Italian. Many people in that area of Italy, which used to belong to Austria, uh, have German names and have German as their second language, and often have Italian first names and German last names. And she is Chiara Claire Lubick, L-U-B-I-C-H. Um, she um, is the founders of the Popolari movement, which some of you may know. And uh, some of her writings that deeply inspire me, specifically on the theme of Jesus abandoned and crucified. Uh, she believes that, and, and espouses, I think, without much uh, difficulty in understanding, that the moment in which Jesus on the cross was most close to us is when he said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Because he took up our abandonment into himself and then ends that psalm by praising the Father who has not abandoned him. Um, and commends his spirit, ultimately, and commends you and me in reuniting us to the Father on the cross. So I think that we try to get across to people that the cross is not a, uh, meant to be a burden. The cross is meant to be a sign of liberation. It is a burden, but ultimately it is a sign of liberation uh, through the burden of, of converting ourselves uh, in, in, under the auspices of the grace of God. Uh, we experience the unity with Jesus Christ who was crucified and abandoned for us. And I think that is a, a powerful message to let people know that this same Jesus who cared to speak soothingly and, and act decisively in regard to Zacchaeus acts decisively and speaks soothingly to you and me in trying to get us to be more like him in dying and in rising. Um, 
The crosses that we face when we go to confession, of course, involve going, physically going to confession, not excusing ourselves, getting to the church, uh, have maybe the uh, difficult time for us to go there. Um, maybe we have to work on more convenient times, but uh, that is on the side of the church. But for those who are receiving the sacrament, it is a cross just sometimes just to go, but it is an important cross to bear. It is a cross certainly to work with our Lord to make satisfaction for our sins. Not just in doing the penance the priest gives us, but in voluntarily setting up a program of voluntary penance, the virtual penance, and living that out so that we uh, become more and more like Jesus Christ. There is a cross also of that ongoing conversion. We must never, never forget that. Let me just conclude with uh, these thoughts. I remember when I was teaching sophomores one time about uh, the nature of original sin. Not easy doctrine to talk to adults about, but those to very young people, especially in our present era when young people often do not have a strong catechetical foundation on their elementary school years. Uh, the, the book described that the after effects of original sin uh, brought about division between ourselves and God, between ourselves and others, and ourselves internally. I mean, that's not an exhaustive list of the division that original sin brings, or is it an exhaustive description of the after effects of original sin? But rather a, a, a good way to remember what happens to us as a result of original sin. Even after original sin is removed in baptism, there is that concupiscence that continues to work against our reunification with God, our uh, unity with others, and our unity within ourselves. Please remember that when Jesus appeared to his apostles, he said simply, peace I leave with you. And uh, what is that peace? That peace is not a thing, it is the person of Jesus Christ, and it is reconciliation with God, reconciliation with others, and above all, reconciliation within ourselves, uh, which uh, make those other two uh, possible. And that is precisely why we go to confession, so that we will experience the peace of Jesus Christ, so that we will experience it by reuni reunification, that we have been separated from God, that we will also experience a, great, a greater unity with others uh, at various levels, and above all, that we will experience within our hearts that peace and joy, as much as we can experience in this world, that Jesus intended not just for Zacchaeus, uh, but for you and me today. So thank you very much. Thank you.